prophet. It parallels 2 Kings chapter 18. A li- uh, a, an incident in the life of King Hezekiah. Before we get started, would you bow with me? <clears throat> Holy Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for your written word and the power that it has in our life. And we pray, Father, that as we look at these examples and see the things that are written therein for our admonition, that you will help us to be humble and receive the word and be willing to obey it in our life. We pray, Father, for forgiveness as we repent of our sins and help us always to walk in the light. We pray for this church that it will always love one another and will always stand on the truth. We pray, Father, for those who are recovering from injury, those who are sick. We pray for the new babies that are being born and the ones coming up. Pray that you'll bless us, protect us, and watch over us. In all things, Holy Father, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah chapter 36 through 39, as I said, is a historical portion of Isaiah. We're not going to look at, get to look at all of this, these chapters, but there is something that's interesting here. It says in verse 1, Isaiah 36 and verse 1, In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Remember, Hezekiah was a good king, one of the very few good kings of the southern kingdom. And he was one who made sweeping reform. He brought people back to God's will. Realigned the nation back in harmony with God's will. And uh, did much good. And even though he was a good king, what we're going to see here is he was not without problems in his life. And I think that's an example for us and instruction for us. We might be good people, but we're going to see adversity. We're going to see problems in our life. Hezekiah was a good king for the most part. But he saw problems in his life due to the nature of evil men. We live in a a nation, a world of evil people. And so we're going to face adversity. So verse 2 says, The king of Assyria sent the Rapshika from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. He stood by the conduit of the upper pool of the highway to the washer's field. The Rapshika is a word that is a title for a high-ranking Assyrian military officer. Now what rank that might be equivalent to in our our way of seeing things, I don't know. But the Rapshika was there to announce to Jerusalem that the king of Assyria had the intent of taking the city. And we know that at least 185,000 Assyrians had surrounded Jerusalem. And we're going to see that number a little bit later on. So Hezekiah is surrounded. They would besiege a city. They would cut off water supplies. They would cut off food supplies. They would basically starve a city into submission. And that's, that's how warfare was waged in the ancient times. And that's what you have here. The Rabshika was going to go there and basically tell the people, look, the best thing for you to do is surrender. The best thing for you to do is give up. Or we're going to starve you in submission and take the city anyway. So you could surrender and it might be better off for you. Or you can starve to death, and he's going to talk about that a little bit later on, and face some severe consequences. Verse 3. There came out to him... Elkimam, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary of Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And the Rapshika said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Now, what we have here is the Holy Spirit is recording what 
this rapshika said. It's a historical record of what the rapshika is saying to Jerusalem and to King Hezekiah as he's speaking to them from the other side of the wall on the outside. He's making this announcement to them. Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? And that's a very interesting question. What do we rest our trust upon? Military might? What do we rest our trust upon? A November election in which we could get a better Senate? What do we rest our trust upon? A presidential hopeful? Or do we rest our trust upon God? That's what we should rest our trust upon. But he's taunting them. What are you resting your trust upon? Do you think that mere words are, uh, are strategy, strategy, excuse me, <laughs> and power for war? And whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? So they've already taken some of the cities of Judah. And now he's saying, why are you going against the king of Assyria? You're rebelling against me. Verse 6. Behold, you are trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. A political ally. He says, oh, you have a political ally in Egypt. It's a broken reed. And that broken reed of a staff, if you lean upon it, is going to pierce your hand. It's not going to be good for you to lean upon this. You cannot place your trust upon Egypt as an ally to help you in this situation. Um, Verse 7. But if you say to me, we will trust in Yahweh our God, is is it not He whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall not worship before this altar? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you... 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. He's further taunting them. He's saying, you can't rely upon Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He's a broken staff, a reed of a staff that's broken. If you lean upon it, it will pierce you through. He says, you trust in Yahweh, your God. But was it not Hezekiah that tore down those high places and said, you shall not worship before this altar? Of course, you see that the Rapshika had a total misunderstanding of what Hezekiah was doing. Hezekiah was saying these false ways of worshiping God are wrong. You've got to worship God according to His instruction in Jerusalem, at the temple, not at these high places. So he's saying, look, you're, you're breaking down the altars of your own God. Of course, that's not true. That was his misunderstanding of things. And he says, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make a wager with you and I'll give you 2,000 horses if you're able on your part to set riders on them. Verse 9. Now then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Moreover, is it without Yahweh that I have come up against this land to destroy it? Yahweh said to me, go up against this land to destroy it. Now he's claiming God is telling him to do it. He said, you're trusted in God to deliver you. You tore down his altars, which isn't true, misunderstanding. He said, but yeah, God told me to come up. Yahweh, your God told me to come up and destroy you. So you see there in verses 4 through 10, uh, the, the Rabshika, this high official within the Assyrian, Assyrian army, speaking to Hezekiah over the wall and saying, look, you, you don't have a chance. You, you need to surrender. And he's taunting them. What does that remind you of? Who taunted Israel and everyone was afraid of him? Except one Shepherd. Goliath of the Philistines. He went out and taunted the armies of Israel. 
Everybody was afraid of him except David. David says, I'll go. I'll do it. God's with me. I'll get him. God's with me. And that's the attitude that should, should be. God is with us. It doesn't matter how big the giant is. God's with us. We'll defeat it because with God's help, we will defeat whatever adversary stands in the way. And so here, that's what you'd have. You'd have, you'd have an official come out and taunt the army, says, you know, basically give us your best shot or surrender or face the consequences. And, and that's what's happening here. Verse 11. Then Elkim, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said, Has my master sent me to, to speak these words to your master and to you and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? What's he saying there? He said, you're going to be starved to death to the point where you're going to have to eat and drink your own waste. That's pretty harsh. He says, I'm going to let everyone hear this. They were saying, speak in Aramaic so only the officials can hear it. He said, I want everyone to hear this message. Verse 13. Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in Yahweh by saying, Yahweh will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. For thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat of his own vine and each of you his own fig tree and each of you will drink from the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain, of wine, and a land of bread and vineyards. He said, don't listen to Hezekiah and resist us. And if you if you work with us, it'll be good for you. We will let you have your own freedom to a certain extent to, to eat your own from your own fig tree, your, your, from your own vine, drink from your own cistern, and then we'll take you away to a land that's like yours. We're going to take you into captivity, but it's going to be a land like yours. They always promise something better, something good. Uh, what I know, from what I understand from the uh, uh, concentration camps of World War II, I think that they lured in the Jewish people with a promise of something good and then got them to the concentration camps. Of course, they're not going to advertise, here's what we're going to do to you. They're going to lure them in, you know. And evil people work the same way as they did in ancient times. And so, so this Rabshakeh is saying, look, don't listen to Hezekiah. Do not listen to him when he says... Your God, Yahweh, is going to deliver you. It'll be better off if you just surrender and we will we'll take care of it. It'll, you'll be okay. And he says in verse 18, Beware lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying, Yahweh will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his, hand, his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of... Shevonim, have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Again, look, he's saying, these other gods didn't help these other nations. What makes you think your God is going to help you? Verse 20. Who among all the gods of these lands deliver their lands out of my hand that Yahweh should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Those other gods didn't help those other people. Your God is not going to help you. But they were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer him. Verse 22, Then Elkim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. 
Why were their clothes torn? Prayer, distress, that was a Hebrew expression to, to tear the clothes. They were, they were distraught. This was, this was bad news. I mean, you have at least 185,000 people surrounding Jerusalem. And you have this Rabshakeh out there making these great boasts. They had heard the fall of these other fortified cities. It looks bleak. It looks bad. Look at chapter 37. As soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. There you see the humility there of Hezekiah. And you see him tearing his clothes, putting on sackcloth that was a clothing worn and that indicated mourning, that he was in sorrow, and he went into the temple. And he sent Elkim, who was over the house, and Shebna, the secretary, and the senior priest, covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. Let's go talk to the prophet, the spokesman of God. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. This, this is a troubled time when you, when you, and he's using the illustration here, this is a time of children ready to be born and there's no strength to give birth to these children. Verse 4, It may be that Yahweh your God will hear the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master and the king of Assyria sent to mock the living God and will rebuke the words that Yahweh your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. You see here, Hezekiah is doing two things that we should do when we find distress problems, insurmountable problems in our life. He opened two means of communication. Prayer and the God's Word. Prayer and God's Word. We go to God in prayer, we have God's Word given to us. We don't have to go to a living prophet. We have the writings of the prophets. He went to the living prophet that was there to talk to him and ask him to pray. So we see that this is an example to us uh, of what to do when we're faced with, with these problems that we face in our life. We are to go to God in prayer in which we communicate with Him. And then we are to go into study in which He communicates with us through the Word of God. Any questions or comments before we go any further? Right. Exactly. That's a, that's a good point. The Rabshika was saying, look, your God sent me over here. Your God told me to conquer you, but if I conquer you, it's going to be good for you. That's a good thing because you're, you're going to be taken care of. And you'll, I'll take you to a land, and there will be you'll have a land of grain, verse 17 of chapter 36. It'll be a, a land of grain and of wine, a land of, of bread and vineyards. He, he's, he's making it look good. Is that not how the devil does? You know, he makes it look good. You know, you, you brought up homosexuality and the increasing problems in our nation with that immorality. And they say, look, you know, uh, 
two consenting adults in a loving relationship is better than a person alone. And then they make it look so good. I mean, after all, they might want to have children. Of course, they have to adopt or go by a means other than what God has arranged as far as a man and wife uh, being together. Uh, but they make it paint. They paint it really good, you know. And it's the it's the whole billboard thing when it comes to sin. You know, sin makes gambling look glamorous, and and and, and you know the the commercials make it look exciting and and appealing. You know, no one sees the other side of that when there's broken homes and people addicted to it and, and, and people uh, whose lives and finances have been destroyed as a result of it. Of course, you don't want to talk about that because no one would want to go to the casinos if they understood the, the danger there. But that, that's a perfect example. Also, you know, in religion, you know, God's telling me this is okay. And, and you'll be okay with, with, with these things. And um, the reality is it's, it's simply a lie. And, you know, he could look around and see himself surrounded. Hezekiah could see the whole, the whole city of Jerusalem surrounded by 185,000 Assyrians. And, you know, we, figuratively speaking, and oh, I guess quite literally, we could see ourselves surrounded by the world. And, and there, there should be a wall there. The church should have that wall there saying this is, this is God's will and anything outside God's will uh, we should not be involved in. You're, you're welcome to, to believe and obey and come in, but we're not going to go out to you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. It was over time, and over the warning that the prophets gave, um, the difference between Israel at the time and Saul, whenever they were, they were being taunted by the Philistines, and now is that Israel was more faithful to God than what they were at this particular period of time. And you go on through the reading list, I started thinking about how, how it parallels, kind of like what you've already alluded to, is um, the Christian, even today, that has gotten to a point where they, they hear it all before I'm talking about the sins that are very high stakes when it comes to, to gambling, and they're, they are down to their last penny. They have to support their family, pay their bills, or for a person who's addicted to, to drugs, and they're having to, to turn to you know, any type of means. And they get to a lot of bottom, and they realize, you know, yes, they're a Christian, and yet they let themselves go to that degree of just living freely. And, and this is the consequence. Mm-hmm. And there, there's no escape outside of just falling completely down in front of God, begging for forgiveness, and starting to make your life right. That's really what Israel needed to do right now. And that's mm-hmm. kind of where they're going here with uh, the Hezekiah and Prophet Isaiah. Exactly. This, this is a wake up call. And, uh, and uh, Hezekiah, Judah, Judah was better, better than it. Israel of the north, but they were not what they should have been. You know what I'm saying? They had a few good kings, whereas Israel of the north, all their kings were bad. Hezekiah was one of the few good kings of Judah, but still there needs to be room for improvement. And and that's exactly what you find. He's surrounded by problems. And for all the good that he did, he's still facing these problems. And so Hezekiah is doing what he knows he should do, seeking God through the prophet and going to God in prayer and asking the prophet to pray and asking the, uh, the priest to humble themselves. There in verse 2, the senior priest covered with sackcloth. I guess that would be the high priest. Does it say high priest in verse 2 and the other... Other versions, the ESV says senior priest. Cover with sackcloth uh, and to, to mourn. This would be 
uh, the, the religious leaders, they are to, to be mournful. And we've already seen in the prophets how some of the religious leaders of Israel and of Judah were some of the problem because of their compromise and their willingness to, to be like the nations round about them. But you see here, Hezekiah is hitting rock bottom, and when you hit rock bottom, there's nowhere else to go but up. And he's, he's going up, so to speak, to God and, and uh, seeking His will. Look at verse 5. He says, uh, When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, or Yahweh, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard with which the young men of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Don't be afraid of them. You know, fear is a powerful tool of the devil. Is it not? Fear of not being able to pay the bills. What do we got to do? Fear of what's going to happen in our nation. What's, fear can paralyze you spiritually. So we have to have a fear of God, a respect for God, but realize He is in control and all things will work together for good according to Romans 8.28, right? Is it Romans 8.28? Romans 8.28, all things work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. So we have to have that, that faith in that all things are going to work together for good. And Hezekiah is being told this by Isaiah the prophet, don't be afraid of his words. He's taunting you, don't be afraid of what he's saying. Verse 7, I will put a spirit in him so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. So he's going to take care of the situation. In verse 8, the Ramshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna. And he heard that the king had left Lachish. Now the king heard concerning Taraka, the king of Cush, he has set out to fight against you. And when he heard it, he sent a me- messengers to Hezekiah saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard that the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands... To- devoting them to destruction, and you shall be delivered? He says, this is, look at our track record. Assyria has devastated these other nations, and you think you're going to be delivered? Verse 12, has the God of the nations delivered them, the nations that my father destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Zeph, or Rezeph, and the people of Eden, who were at Tisler? Verse 13, Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of the Sepharzim, the king of Hina, the king of Iva? He's he's, he's giving them an example, just a, a, a list. Look at all these people I've conquered. What makes you think that you're going to be delivered if all these have fallen? All of these have been conquered conquered and you know this comes to mind you think of all all the states now that are either approving of civil unions between homosexuals or outright homosexual marriage state after state i think at least five states now there may be more but people will say look at all these states giving in giving in to their agenda It doesn't matter if 49 states do. It's still wrong. It doesn't matter if Texas does. It's still wrong. We've still got to take a stand. And we can't be intimidated by the media or by what we read in the paper about all these states approving of civil unions, approving of this. So what? 
they're wrong and it's still wrong. And we've still got to preach that and take our stand against it. And so that, that's how the devil works. Look at all these people giving in. You know, and the Ramshika is saying, look at all these, these nations being conquered. Who's going to deliver you? They were conquered. Then verses 14 through 20, you have Hezekiah's prayer for deliverance. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. He took the letter, spread it before the Lord in the temple. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, or to Yahweh, O Yahweh of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God and you alone, you are God and you alone, are, are all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Notice how he starts out this prayer by praising and exalting God. Yahweh of hosts, you are the God of the true armies of righteousness. Host. That's what host refers to. His armies. The God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim. Of course, in the Holy of Holies, the, the, the literal uh, uh, cherubim, on the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God would be there in uh, that uh, sense. But He is the God in heaven above the cherubim. His power and majesty is, is being uh, spoken of here in this prayer. You are the God, and He says, You alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, You have made heaven and the earth. You are alone God. All the other gods are false gods. You alone are the one true God. So the reasons why those other nations fell as a result of their gods not delivering them is because they weren't gods. They were trusting in stone and wood and and gold and silver. They were not trusting in the one true living God who is the ruler of the kingdoms of the earth As Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, God rules in the kingdoms of men. And we see here he is the one who created the heaven and the earth. So he's praising and exalting God. Verse 17, incline your ear, O Yahweh, and hear. Open your eyes, O Yahweh, and see and hear all the words of Sennacherib. That's the king. Which he has sent to mock the living God. So he's praying, he's, he's, he's making his petition unto God. This is fervent prayer. And you see the fervency in this as he, spreads, he spread out this letter before the Lord and he's praying fervently before the Lord. What's the difference in prayer and fervent prayer? Heart and soul in it. That's a good way of describing it. Hearing and listening. Fervent prayer involves really, really wanting and desiring and believing God will do what He said He would do. Blessing us. Delivering us. Being with us. It's the difference in praying and thanking God for your meal. And when you find out you have a loved one with a terminal illness, and you seek the Lord in prayer, fervent prayer. Now all of our prayers should be sincere, but some prayers are more intense than others. That's fervent prayer. There's a fervency there. And so we, we should be sincere in our prayers always. But the, the, the fervent prayer of the righteous avails much, James says. So we, we pray fervently. And here you have Hezekiah praying fervently un, unto the Lord. And that means we're, we're pouring our heart and soul into it. It's the type of prayers that you see Jesus engaged in in the Garden of Gethsemane. Whereas they were different than some of the other prayers that he had in which he he prayed and thanked the Lord, his Father, for something. But do you not see a fervency 
in the Garden of Gethsemane that you don't see in everywhere else. There's a fervency there. So there is that intensity uh, in prayer. A focused nature uh, of fervent prayer we see here. And he's asking the Lord to incline his ear, open his eyes and see all the words of Sennacherib which he has sent to mock the living God. Of course, he's not telling this so God can know. God already knows. But it, it is Hezekiah acknowledging his complete dependence on God. That's part of fervent prayer. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, his complete dependence on the Father. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. That fervency in prayer. Verse 18, Truly, O Yahweh, the king of Assyria, have laid waste all the nations and all their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods. But the, men, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they are destroyed. So now, O Yahweh, our God, save us from the hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. That you alone are Yahweh. So we see here this, this beautiful prayer. Prayer of deliverance that Hezekiah is wording before the Lord. Any questions or comments before we go any further? We might get through chapter 37. We're pressing the time on that. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word that Yahweh has spoken concerning him. She despises you, she scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes on the heights against the Holy One of Israel. They were speaking against God's people, and thus by doing that, they were speaking against God. Verse 24, By your servants you have mocked the Lord, and have said, With many chariots I have gone up the heights of the mountains to the far recesses of Lebanon to cut down its tallest cedars, its choicest cypress, to come to its remotest height, its most fruitful forest. I dug wells, I drank water to dry up in the sole of my foot, of my foot all the streams of Egypt. Verse 26. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruin, while their inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded, and have become like plants of the field, and like the tender grass, like the grass of the housetop, blied before it is grown. I know you're sitting down, I know you're going out, and you're coming in, and you're raging against me, because you have raged against me, and your complacency has come to my ears. I will put my hook in your nose, and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way in which you came. This is what God is, going, is saying to uh, Sennacherib, saying to uh, that king and to uh, those who are taunting Israel. Verse 30, And this shall be the sign for you. This year you shall eat what grows of itself, and in the second year what springs from that. Then in the third year sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord of, How, of, Lord of hosts will do this. In other words, Judah is not going anywhere. Judah is not going anywhere. Sennacherib is not going to have an effect. Verse 33, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there or, there, or come before it with a shield or cast on it a siege mound against it, 
by the way that he came, by that way he shall return, and he shall not come in this place, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Now, why did he say that about David? This is several generations removed from David. Several generations removed from David. Why did he say that? For the sake of my servant David, I'm not going to let Judah or, or, or Jerusalem be destroyed. He made a covenant with David that of his descendants one would come that would rule on the throne and set up a temple and set up a kingdom. And who's that? Jesus. So to preserve that seed line, there had to be this protection. For the sake of my servant David, I'm not going to let this happen. In verse 36, the angel of Yahweh went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people rose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. The angel of Yahweh. Some have suggested that this angel may be the second person of the Godhead, Christ himself. As he is depicted all throughout the Old Testament as the angel of Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh. At times he even speaks as though he were God. And even sometimes he's worshipped. We know God does not allow people to worship an angel. So some have suggested this may have been Christ himself, or it may have just been a special representative uh, angel. But be that as it may, this heavenly being of the Lord went out, just a single angel. This is how powerful, if this is just referring to uh, an angelic being in the created sense, this single angel struck down 185,000 Assyrians in the camp in one night. Killed them all. When they got up, behold, these were all dead bodies. Verse 37, Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. And here's what happened. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nishra, his god, Adramelech and Shiraz, his son struck him down with the sword. And after they escaped into the land of Ararat, Arashdod, Arashdon, his son reigned in his place. This is exactly what was prophesied that would happen. He would fall by the sword in his own family. And that's exactly what happens. It's very interesting. There was an inscription found. I don't have the information on it, but I'll probably get it for next week. Uh, an inscription was found either on a stone or, or a tablet or something. I have to get the exact information. About Sennacherib surrounding Jerusalem. And it boasts, Sennacherib boasts in that. He says, I have the king of Judah surrounded like a bird in a cage. But he doesn't record anything about the 185,000 being killed. You know why? Kings don't record their defeats. Kings don't record their humiliation. But there has been archaeological evidence found of this very event where he's boasting about having the king of Judah surrounded and he's like a bird in a cage. But he doesn't record his defeat. And that's typical of the monarchs of ancient world. This simply is another example of you don't mock God. You're not going to get away with mocking God. You reap what you sow. God is not mocked. And you have this example here of this. And you can see it all through history. I, I, I you know, think about the example of, of, of history of people who have mocked God. And the results are disastrous. I'm not suggesting anything directly happening as a result. But you've heard the story of the, of the ocean liner that was built was boasted of being unsinkable. 1912. 
Someone asked about that ship. And one of the persons on there said, Ma'am, not even God can sink this ship. And it was the Titanic. On its maiden voyage, it sank. You don't mock God. So we have to take His Word very, very seriously. Next week, we will read uh, and study chapter 38 and 39 as we continue this historical section of Isaiah.